Well, good afternoon, everybody, to, gosh, I think, is this the fifth in the series of WebEx sessions on furlough? Um, we're delighted to have you all join us today. Um, those of you that were on the session last week, I'm sure, will appreciate uh, the irony with Jen and I finishing up to say, well, that'll be the last session for a while until we have any updates. And I think probably within an hour or two um, of us um, finishing that session, we had a number of updates. So it's been quite an emotional roller coaster since last Wednesday, I'm sure, for yourselves as well as for us. Um, so what have we had? Well, we've had two more, if not three more, updates to the HMRC guidance. Um, we've also had the very vexed Treasury direction that was issued last Wednesday, and Jen will come on to, to talk about that. Um, we've helpfully had as well from the HMRC two separate notes. One, a note on how to calculate the 80% when you're submitting your claim, um, and one which sets out a step-to-step -step or step-by-step -step guide on how to submit your claim as well. So lots of documentation since we last spoke, um, and also the portal opening yesterday. So I'm sure many of you will have submitted claims yesterday and will have experienced what, what that's been like. Um, the feedback that we've had on the portal has been that it's been fairly straightforward, quite easy to use, which is really good to hear. Um, I think it crashed a couple of times yesterday, but generally it worked quite well. Well, there's a sense, I think, that it's set up to receive a number of claims um, in a set period. So it may be that once um, it reaches that maximum, it, it, it stops for a while. But um, generally, the, the feedback's been positive. Um, the other thing I picked up yesterday, just for interest to share with you, is the British Chamber of Commerce have suggested, or that from a survey that they've done, their view is two thirds of all employers in the UK will be accessing the furlough scheme. So. Um, that's obviously quite a high number. Sorry, can I just ask everyone to remain on mute throughout the session? Thank you. Um, so what are we going to cover today? Well, Jen's going to do a sweep up of what's changed since last week. Um, we're then going to just pick up some of the outstanding questions. There aren't many now, thankfully, um, and then have a look at some of the practicalities round about the portal. Um, and obviously pick up questions that come in as the session goes on. So um, with that, if I can hand over to you, Jen. Thanks, Morag. Um, yes, yeah, so as Morag says, uh, you didn't expect to see us uh, back so soon. I'm not going to lie. I think uh, there was a collective sigh, shall we say politely, uh, when more updated guidance and the Treasury direction dropped um, at the at the tail end of last week. So just in terms of some uh, a kind of refresher on the, the key updates to the position that we were in um, previously, um, first of all, we've got a shift in the kind of qualifying date, um, an inverted comma. So um, previously the guidance has said that it would be the 28th of um, February, if you were on your employer's payroll at the 28th of February, um, then that that was enough. Um, it subsequently uh, got changed last week to being on your employer's payroll as at the 19th of March, but also the sting in the tail there is that you have to have been included in an RTI um, submission by that date as well. So effectively, I've been speaking to a few clients and I think um, that is perhaps a bit of a red herring, to be honest. I don't think it's, it's captured um, substantially more um, employees than, um, than the sort of previous 90, 28th of February cutoff had. So I think that's a bit of a shame probably for some of the, the new starts um, who thought that they were maybe going to get um, the protection extended. Um, the scheme itself, in terms of um, how long it will be open for claims, has been extended to the end of June. So that's effectively another month that we're getting, um, which I think is is good news um, and will come as a relief for a number of employers who were maybe thinking um, already getting quite stressed about what they needed to do and, and the prospect of getting to the end of May quite quickly in terms of um, planning and, and payments. So that's that certainly come as a relief um, for a number of employers. Um, so if we look if we look sort of in total at, at what we got 
last week, um, what we've tried to do is distill down the updated guidance and the Treasury um, direction, as I say. We have, um, as I'm sure a number of you um, all kind of been considering, what, what kind of status does the Treasury direction have? What even is a Treasury direction, frankly? Um, it does have legal status um, in terms of it flowing from legislation, so it flows from the uh, Corona Virus Act. So from a from a sort of technical legal perspective, it has more standing, I would say, than um, than guidance, um, which I think is then what spooked quite a few of us when we started reading through it and identified some areas where it, it appeared um, to either contradict or just not marry up entirely with with what we had understood had been quite clear information in the guidance. We've actually um, heard uh, and, and seen um, on an HMRC a response to a query that was raised that their position is that they don't expect employers to be reading line by line the Treasury direction. They are expecting employers to operate on the basis of what the guidance tells them to do. Um, now, cynics among us might say, well, that's that's good for them to say that just now, but will they still be saying that if they if they audit employers in a year or eighteen months' time? But I think that's quite comforting because our our view on it as a team last week was, you know, they cannot shift the goalposts on the Friday, you know, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday before the the portal opens um, and impose new or conflicting um, rules and conditions on employers who have been operating in good faith on the basis of what the guidance has said. So I think that's helpful where, where we identify things that maybe are unclear or don't match up entirely. Um, we can hopefully rely on that um, statement from HMRC that they, they really will expect employers to follow the guidance. And also we're aware that the declaration that employers make at the end when they submit their claim, it says that they, um, they declare that the Claims that they're making are made in accordance with the guidance, and that's um, consistent with what HMRC has said. So that's that's helpful. Um, so just kind of, I, I guess, running through a few things that um, changed last week um, or have been clarified. Um, no particular order, but just things that we've been talking about on these webinars um, over the last few weeks. So uh, extremely vulnerable shielding. Individuals, as you'll know, um, we have talked about the fact that they can be furloughed, and our interpretation of that is that they can be furloughed purely on the basis of their status as being extremely vulnerable and being directed to shield um, under public health guidance. What the government have done is they have extended statutory sick pay entitlement um, to cover those individuals as well. I think just as a backup um, for circumstances where employers might not choose to furlough them for some reason, and you know there there might be some situations where an employer decides um, that they're not going going to furlough, um, and so in those circumstances, a shielding employee who's not able to come into work or work from home might be left in an unpaid leave type category. So they they can be paid SSP. Um, if they're not furloughed, and we'll come on to talk about that quite binary approach that, that needs to be taken, I think, to uh, whether you're on SSP slash sick pay or whether you're on furlough, you, you can't be on both from the government's perspective. Um, the other change that came as a result of kind of clarification from the Treasury direction is, you know, we talked about before your your rationale or your justification for furloughing would HMRC impose a really high test of was that person going to be made redundant um, but for the furlough or could it be a more um, general test that your business operations had been severely impacted by COVID-19 um, and that you were furloughing employees against that general backdrop of economic um, difficulties with a view to avoiding redundancies. Um, so the Treasury direction guidance is much looser than the redundancy test that we, we thought might be coming based on the guidance um, and talks really more in terms of people being 
um, furloughed as a result of um, economic or social or health issues um, arising from the COVID-19 crisis. So I think that should come as a relief to employers that have been um, perhaps worrying about whether you know they will be challenged um, in a really intense way by HMRC based on every single individual situation. I think if employers have furloughed employees in good faith because of the economic effects um, that COVID-19 has had on their business, um, then they, they should be in, in good shape, I think, for justifying that decision. Um, so, written agreement. <laughs> this I don't know about all of you, but certainly uh, as a team, we were all quite um, concerned about some terminology in the Treasury direction that came out saying that the employer and the employee had to agree in writing that the employee would cease all work um, during furlough. The reason for the kind of sharp intake of breath on that was the fact that um, the guidance had never um, required written agreement from the employee. It had always talked about um, agreeing furlough with employees and um, the only written obligation had been that the employer would um, confirm in writing slash kind of notify the employee of their furloughed status, which is you know the letters that we've all been working on um, confirming that you shouldn't do any work um, and that you're um, you're on furlough uh, for however long the employer has chosen uh, to furlough you. So that um, that caused quite a bit of alarm, and I think made a number of employers who had. Um, perhaps not gone down the route of the kind of classic sign and return approach and had either done a uh, deemed acceptance um, or you know somewhere in between that in terms of their seeking agreement from employees to worry whether um, that, that was going to be used by HMRC as a way of saying those claims are not legitimate. I think now that we've got the, um, the clarification from HMRC that people are to operate on the basis of the guidance and we've seen some other tweets. I don't know if any of you are following HMRC, I think it's like HMRC customer services on Twitter, but I'd suggest that you do. <laughs> um, it's kind of addictive and we're now getting to know a few of the um, the recurring characters at HMRC uh, customer services who uh, basically provide instant responses to some really difficult questions. Um, and one of them last week had set hairs running by saying, oh yeah, that's right, you do need written agreement from the employee um, and had only then the next day to be corrected by one of his colleagues who picked up um, that thread and said, no, that's, that's actually not correct um, as long as you've got the um, written notification from the employer, that should be sufficient. So, you know, as with all of the things that we're talking about in the webinars, we can't guarantee the approach that HMRC will take, but I think what we can say is that um, we, we would be a bit more relaxed um, about uh, this requirement for, for written agreement. If you've got it, great. If you don't, then I don't think you need to be as worried as we were perhaps uh, at the tail end of last week. Um, sick, sick employees being placed on furlough. We spoke last week about the fact that we had clarity on that and that as long as you were very clearly saying um, to those on long-term sick leave, really, I think um, that they were being moved and their status was being changed from being um, employees on sick leave to furloughed employees. You could do that under the guidance. You could claim furlough pay for them under the scheme. Um, and obviously you could have claimed under the rebate scheme for the SSP while they were sick, but you can't claim, basically you can't have it both ways. You can't have dual status. So you have to pick as an employer which one um, you're going with, which seemed um, to be pretty clear. Um, the Treasury, direction contained a provision which, after a number of um, commentators had kind of picked over it um, on one reading seemed consistent with the guidance on that and on another reading seemed potentially to take us back to the territory of you can't put someone on sick leave until 
effectively their, their sick line has expired. I think as with the written agreement point, we're now back feeling a bit more comfortable and relaxed about the fact that we can rely on what the guidance said, which is what employers have been doing for the last couple of weeks. And so you can furlough employees who are on long-term um, sick leave if you, generally speaking, feel you've got that kind of business justification for, for furlough anyway. So um, I think that has been clarified. The reverse, if you've got people on furlough who then say to you, I'm sick, um, and I want to go on to sick leave. Um, it's up to you, according to the guidance, um, to decide whether you're going to shift their status again. Um, the only thing that we would say about that is just be careful because uh, what's not clear and what I think you would want reassurance on is if you shifted them, does that then mean that the furlough period comes to an end for the purposes of your um, you know, your three week minimum. And I think from a sort of logical assessment position, if, if the guidance says you can't have it both ways, you can't have a dual status, I think we'd probably need to operate on the cautious basis that if you move them on to sick pay, um, then it would be um, sick leave that they would be on rather than furlough leave and your, your kind of clock for furlough leave would, would end. Um, so I'm, build, I'm building it up for you guys, I'm building the tension, so holidays, um, which is what um, every single week we've been saying to you, uh, we don't know, we don't know, we're waiting on uh, clarification. I think we knew the, the direction of travel on it and we anticipated that we would get an update to say that you could have people off on holiday at the same time as being on furlough and that's what we got um, last Friday, I think it was at Friday at six o'clock. They seem to have a habit of um, ruining employment law and HR professionals' weekends by dropping updates at dinner time on on Friday evenings. So um, I, I just I direct you to the guidance on on this to read it in detail. But um, the kind of headline news on it is that you can have employees on um, on holiday. It doesn't go as far as to say employers can force employees to take holidays during furlough. Um, I mean, my take on that is the the ability under um, the working time regs still exists for employers to give employees notice that they're going on annual leave. But um, I would just take take care on that one. And then the the crucial thing that you'll be thinking from a commercial perspective is what's the pay implications? And the guidance is very clear that employees who are on holiday at the same time as being furloughed are entitled to holiday pay uh, for that period. I am not going to go down the rabbit hole um, on today's webinar of <laughs> calculating holiday pay because you've all been through that pain over the last few years. But you know that it is more than 80% of normal pay. So employees um, will be entitled to their normal holiday pay at their normal um, you know, full 100% um, amounts and components of pay. Um, and you as the employer would need to top that up. So that would maybe be a consideration that you need to take into account just from a commercial perspective before you move them um, onto holiday um, dual status, if that was something that you were thinking about. So I think that's it. Mora will, I'm sure, correct me <laughs> if I've missed out any of the roundup. Mora, I hand over to you at the moment. Thanks, Jen. Uh, yeah, no, I think that was everything on my list in terms of key changes since last week. So thank you for that. Um, just picking up on one of the questions that's been asked there about um, has there been any confirmation about what the eligibility criteria is for shielding? So um, is the NHS letter sufficient? So that would be the letter that would be issued to vulnerable individuals to advise them that they should shield. Um, there's been no further updates since that. So my view is, yes, that would be the evidence that you would um, use to demonstrate that somebody does fall within that category. Um, you might have individuals who haven't received a letter like that who feel that they fall into the category in any event. Um, in normal circumstances, then we would be saying to you to get medical advice on that, but obviously you um, need to be careful the extent to which you pursue medical advice at, at, in the, the current situation. So I um, hope that helps to, to deal with that query. 
Um, in terms of outstanding points, I think, Jen, you probably picked up most of them. It's the question of if you put somebody on um, sick pay when they're on when they were on furlough, does that mean you you break the three weeks continuity potentially? Yes, I think we think you still have to be quite careful with that. Um, thankfully, the holiday question is resolved. Other than, as Jen said, this point about um, can you still require employees? Can an employer say to an employee, you need to take a certain amount of holiday when you're on furlough leave? The, the key issue there is round about the um, working time directive and ensuring that employees take holiday in order to have proper rest and relaxation. And there's one view that if an employer is forcing employees to take holiday while they're on furlough, it means that they're not getting that period of rest and relaxation under the working time directive. Um, but I think the kind of majority view is that employers can request that employees take holiday during a period of furlough, but just to, to flag that that's still not certain, um, as is the case with quite a, a few bits and pieces with this particular scheme. Um, the other point that we mentioned before, so just for completeness to mention again, because there's been no clarity on it, still is this issue around about continuity of employment. If you do rehire an employee, whether that means, you know, what does What's their date of commencement with you then? Is it from when you rehire them, or do they have continue, continuous employment back to when you originally hired them? Um, it will be a small category of people. I don't know how many of you have actually rehired staff, but just to flag to you that that's still a, a potential issue. Um, just briefly in terms of practicalities on the, the portal, um, one point that I did see mentioned somewhere, you, you'll maybe be, you'll, you'll be aware, those of you that have used the portal, that if you're making an application for a furlough for less than 100 employees, you have to enter the individual's details um, on the portal. If you're making an application for 100 or more employees, then you have to download the information onto a spreadsheet and submit it that way. Um, I did see commentary somewhere that you only have 30 minutes while you're on the portal to input the information. And so if you're putting in the individual details for 100 people, that's likely to take you over 30 minutes. My understanding, though, is that it's not that you only have 30 minutes in total on the portal. My understanding is if you're inactive for 30 minutes or more, that your your claim will, will stop effectively and you'll have to start the process again. Um, but just to flag to you that if you are going on and you've got that information to, to enter, it will be quite a process. So making sure you've got that uh, to hand. The other point that I've seen mentioned quite a bit in, on Twitter um, and in commentary on the portal is the government calculator that's been provided isn't always accurate or isn't accurate. Um, so just to flag to you, to double check your figures and not just rely on the, the government calculator when you're putting in your claim, I expect that will be fixed um, over the next while, but just to, to flag that to you. Um, again, an issue in terms of the portal is there's reference to a day's pay being calculated based on calendar days rather than working days. So for those individuals that fall into the category of salaried employees, um, a daily rate will be based on calendar days, as I say, rather than um, working days at the moment. So again, just to flag that to you, and again, I expect it will be something that will be fixed at some point uh, in, the, in the future. Um, and I think that was the key ones on the portal itself. Is there anything else there, Jen? That you're aware of that I've not covered? No, I, um, I think just a general sense um, that it's better than some people maybe thought it would. Um, yeah, yeah. We were on um, our, like our first webinar, we, we spoke about it because there was a lot of cynicism that, you know, as FHMRC are going to get this up and running. Um, by the end of April, but I think we felt well we have to, um, and and they have to their credit, um, they've got it up and running. I think they have it staffed by thousands of employees, um, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but certainly the feedback we've received is that it it doesn't take very long, and it it is what they said it would be in terms of it being a basic amount of information that you have to produce. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, one of the points I did want to pick up, and Jane, jump in on this if if you've got extra to add on it, but is the issue of what is in what is included and what isn't included when you're looking at well, what is regular wages, what is regular salary? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
this is another area the, where I think the Treasury Directive has caused a fair bit of confusion. So um, under the guidance, what we had originally in the HMRC guidance was, you remember the provisions that say out there, if you're a salaried employee or if you're full time or part time, then it's based on your salary as at the February payroll. If your salary or your wages is variable, then you look at the 12 months average over the last year or the payment that you received in the same month in the previous um, tax year. Those provisions have now been removed completely from the employee guidance and instead, as we mentioned at the beginning, you've now got HMRC guidance that sets out how you calculate 80% of salary. And on the face of it, um, it's fairly straightforward and I'm just trying to see if I can get it up on my screen here. Um, not coming up at the moment, but it, it kind of sets out very clearly that uh, regular payments would include compulsory overtime, compulsory commission, compulsory fees, etc., um, but doesn't include discretionary payments. The Treasury Directive, on the other hand, uh, is, has very complex provisions. I think it's in paragraph seven of the Treasury Directive, talking about what should and shouldn't be included for the purposes of, of regular wages. And Jen and I last Thursday and Friday were reviewing the Treasury guidance and I have to say found it very hard to get our heads round, would that be fair to say, Jen? <laughs> um, it's, it's not straightforward. So prior to the Treasury Directive being issued, I think we were saying, well, you know, it's, it's within the guidance, it talks about um, contractual payments and compulsory payments, etc. They seem to be included. The Treasury Directive perhaps changes that slightly and is a lot more complex. But as Jen said at the beginning, the clear guidance that we're getting from HMRC is when you're calculating the, how much you're going to pay, you look at the HMRC guidance, including the how do you calculate 80% of pay guidance rather than the Treasury Directive. So really just to flag to you um, that on the face of things, it looks like we should be looking at the HMRC guidance and not the Treasury Directive, but just to be aware that there's the Treasury Directive sitting in the background, which isn't quite as straightforward. Um, do you want to have a go at picking up some of the questions, Jen, that have come in so far? Yeah, absolutely. What we've got. Um, so let me just go back up. Uh, so you picked up the furling shielding ones. Um, when calculating holiday pay, we use the 12 weeks before the holiday or the 12 weeks before they were furloughed. I mean, being completely honest with you, I don't know the answer mm -hmm. to that off the top of my head because um, I think like a lot of these questions, the, the interplay of normal employment law principles with furlough added as a bolt-on has not been tested, so it's not been tested in tribunal and it's not really been, um, you know, we've not been given specific guidance on all of that. Um, I would, I mean, if you want to take a cautious and compliant approach, then I think you would need to just adopt your normal approach to calculating holiday pay. So if you use a yes. averaging approach, then I wouldn't use you know, the 80% as part of that, I would go back to when you last had a kind of regular um, payment for the employee. I think to do otherwise um, might be open to challenge. Um, it might subsequently uh, come to pass that a tribunal says, no, that that was okay, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying to you that that's, um, that's the right thing to do. I think you should really be going on the basis of their normal and regular um, pay when they were, were at work and getting everything that comes along with that. What do you think, Maura? Yeah, I would agree with that, absolutely. I think it's the safest approach to take um, and it, it means that the, any challenge on the amount that you actually pay should be limited. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, um, does I'm going to pick up yeah, the next one. Yeah. About, does three weeks mean 21 days or does it have to be a set weekly period, e.g. Sunday to Saturday? Um, our view is it's the 21 days. It doesn't have to be the kind of tax weeks, if you like, for that for those purposes, Sunday to Saturday, as long as it's 21 days continuous. There's no suggestion in the guidance that it has to be set weekly periods. Um, the next one about, we have staff currently furloughed but have upcoming annual leave. Do we now contact those staff and ask them if they still wish to keep the leave booked before automatically paying holiday pay? Um, 
the answer to that is it really depends. If if the staff have already got annual leave booked, um, I think you can you can just let them take their holiday, you know, their holiday time and top up the salary. And it may be in your interest to do that because it means that your staff are starting to take their holidays what, during the furlough period, and you're not going to end up with lots of holiday accrued at the end of the furlough period. It depends as well, though, to some extent, on the communications you issued when you first placed them on furlough and whether you said anything about holiday within that communication or not. Um, I know some employers, for example, have said that whilst you're on holiday, sorry, whilst you're on furlough, you can't take holiday. So individuals might have an expectation that they're not using up their holiday entitlement whilst they're on furlough. So you might want to just revisit the original communications. Um, but generally, you can, st you know, if an employee's booked holiday, you can insist that they continue to take that holiday rather than cancel it. Um, and as I say, it may be in your interest to do that so you don't end up with too much bill-up holiday at the end of the, the furlough period. Um, charities in receipt of public funding. I know in furloughing, furlough guidance states that organisations who receive public sector grants can't apply, but the grants may not be enough to cover their scheme, their costs, or can they use the furlough scheme? It's a question that we're being asked a lot, understandably, by organisations who are in receipt of government funding. Um, the answer, the kind of general answer is, if you receive public funding which covers 100% of your salary costs, then you should not be furloughing staff because you're already receiving their, their payments or their, their costs um, from the government and you would effectively be receiving them twice. You'll have some individuals where very clearly um, you have grants that are for staff costs and so it would be difficult for you then to furlough those individuals as well. But you'll have other organisations where we have one, for example, this morning that we were speaking to where 80% of their staff costs are covered by income that they receive through the services that they provide, 20% of their uh, staff costs are covered by public sector grant. And so it's not quite so easy to determine whether you can furlough those individuals or not. Um, and I think you just have to look on that on a, on a case by case basis. But the general rule is if they're already being paid through public sector money, then you shouldn't be furloughing them as well. So you just have to be quite careful with that one. Um, do you have a view on pay for bank holidays whilst furloughed? I have in mind that the case on holiday pay averaged over 52 weeks. So again, it's a bit similar to the question that you've already dealt with, I think, um, Jen. I would use the rules that you normally use for the purposes of calculating holiday pay, as Jen said, um, and that would include for bank holidays as well as general holidays. Jen, and they mention the bank holidays actually specifically in the guidance now on, um, on their section on the interplay between furlough and holidays, and they say Basically, someone would ordinarily be off for a bank holiday um, at a time when they're furloughed. You can agree that um, you'll claim in respect of that amount, but the top up uh, will be required to bring them in line with what they should should normally get. So that will be for anything um, that's working time um, related. Um, and there's a question there about if you've got, you can only make one furlough claim per period, which is, is correct. So can you claim for an individual who's not made the 21 days by the time you want to enter the claim? Yes, you can. When you put in your claim, you can claim for future periods of furlough as well as past previous periods of furlough if it fits into the um, time in, in which you're making your claims. Obviously, then, if for any reason that individual is not on furlough and comes back to work, then you would have to make that clear to HMRC. Um, but you can claim for future furlough periods as well as previous furlough periods. One of the other questions we've been asked um, is, what are we picking up now in terms of are employers keeping staff on furlough or are they starting to turn their mind to redundancies? Um, and if they are, what, how are they approaching the redundancy consultation? And can you consult with staff while on furlough, which is a question I know we've dealt with um, previously. Um, I'd say our experience is that the, the priority and the focus has been on furlough probably up until the beginning of this week now that the portal is open. But certainly, increasingly, we're starting to have conversations with clients now about um, looking at potential redundancies. Um, I think that was heightened until the scheme, uh, the announcement was made last Thursday. I think it was that the scheme was going to be extended to the end of June. Um, certainly, if the scheme was going to come to an end at the end of May, 
the question of redundancies was was becoming into focus, I think more. Um, I read something this morning which suggested that the, there would be two million redundancies as a result of COVID-19, um, notwithstanding the fact that we've got the furlough scheme. And I think that is likely to be correct. I think employers are accessing the furlough scheme as much as they can, but there is the issue about, well, even once lockdown is over, um, how quickly are businesses going to recover? in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And you'll all have seen as well the kind of news reports about, well, when are we ever going to get back to what was the old normal? <laughs> um, you know, there's going to be social distancing for quite a period of time and that'll impact. Some employers might look at, well, how do we implement social distancing? Does that mean we have to reduce our number of staff, etc.? And these are some of the issues that we covered on the, the session last week. You know, when you're starting to look to the future, um, should you be thinking about planning? If you are going to look at redundancy, should you be thinking about starting to plan for those now? And we spoke about the, the, you know, your collective consultation obligations. So potentially you're looking at 100 or more redundancies. You've got your 45 day collective consultation as well as your individual consultation. Or if you're looking at 20 or more, but under 100, you've got your 30 day consultation to build into that process. So um, I think these are all things that we're starting to see it, come through in terms of the queries we're receiving from clients. I think there is definitely a sort of move on to the next phase now in planning for, well, what will we do, um, you know, longer term in terms of staff retention? Would you say that's fair, Jen? I think you've probably been receiving similar questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think spot on, basically. I think once people have put through their first claim under the scheme and they're familiar with the portal and they have the comfort that they are receiving the money through as promised, I think the next claim, if people are doing it for consecutive months, will be much more straightforward and you'll also at that point have got all of your comms out to people. So you should have much less furlough type stuff to be doing. I think it's that that's then the point, no doubt, that people will be applying their mind to um, kind of more medium term planning. Yeah. So, I mean, the normal rules apply. And as we said before, it is still possible to make people redundant, um, you know, either make them redundant and not furlough them if you feel um, that's the right thing to do. Although we've mentioned before that certainly would be quite high risk, I think, if it was a COVID related redundancy situation because the employee would be able to say, well, you should have furloughed me, um, or alternatively, um, you decide actually after a month or two of the furlough scheme that things are looking so bleak that um, you are going to effect redundancies at that point. So, yeah, that uh, sadly <laughs> seems to be the next the next phase and changes to T's and C's as well, which we spoke about um, last week. Just picking up on a couple of. The other questions that have come through, um, just try to get to as many of these as possible. Uh, well, as we said at the start of all these seminars, where things are really specific to your business, um, we can't give um, kind of bespoke advice. We can only really provide general guidance. Um, if someone's on long-term sick leave and running out of sick pay and wants to be furloughed, is there a capability issue? Um, I mean, the answer is. Yes, isn't it? Because in non-COVID times, you would just be following your capability process and you might at that point be looking at a final meeting and termination of employment. Um, touch on the trust and confidence issue that we spoke about last week. Um, I think where you've got the option to keep people employed at this really difficult time. And I think you've got, I guess the way I'm starting to look at it is it's, it's less of a employer specific focus more of a what's your moral obligation of trying to keep as many people in jobs through this pinch point as possible. yes you might have in ordinary times a fair reason to dismiss but the reality is if you dismiss that person now and they're incapable of doing a job for you they may well be incapable of getting another job at the moment um, and even if they were capable of getting another job from a health perspective, they probably wouldn't be able to get another job because the market's so bad. So the I guess the rationale there is there's an option for you to extend their employment with you um, 
obviously what happens at the end of furlough um, and you have to then look at getting your up-to-date medical advice and, and having the conversation with employees at, at that point. But I think that is um, it's certainly a good question and it's the way that we're approaching it as clients. Um, maternity, if someone pays full pay to an employee on maternity leave, for example, for 26 weeks, um, can you claim um, without bringing the maternity leave to an end? I think the answer is uh, yes, you can. The furlough scheme talks about being able to claim for enhanced um, maternity pay that you pay. My interpretation of that is the government cannot tell you that it's possible to claim for that um, if it wouldn't if, if it would be wrong and in contravention of normal employment law principles. Um, I don't think that you can seek to take somebody off maternity leave you know, in the same way as we were talking about with sick leave. It's not it's not the same at all. That's a fundamental um, right that an individual has. So they will stay on maternity leave and they will stay entitled to all of their statutory protections. That's made clear in the guidance. But I think that's just the kind of mechanical bit where the government is actually saying you can reclaim that because that's a cost um, that you're paying. Obviously, again, with the overlay of as long as you are making, as long as you're making use of the furlough scheme more generally, and that person would fall into that um, that category, if you like. Um, so I think that's great in terms of statutory maternity pay. I think by sort of deduction, we have to assume that that's not reclaimable because they've expressly said the enhanced element can be reclaimed. I think it's the case that with all other statutory leave payments, that's just on the employer. And then for SSP, um, there's the ability for some smaller employers to, to seek a rebate on that. Um, yeah. Let me just check. Other... I was just going to come back while you're looking at the other questions, Jen. Sorry, just on the consultation, redundancy consultation mm -hmm. process as well. So our view is, yes, you can carry out redundancy consultation whilst employees are on furlough. Um, that's based on the fact that the guidance states that at the end of a period of furlough, employees may be made redundant. Um, there's obviously this question about, well, does that mean that the individuals are working whilst on furlough and there's the strict prohibition against working? Um, but I, I think you know it, it's common sense that you should be able to consult during um, during a furlough period. Um, I think one of the issues though will be from a practical perspective, how do you actually carry out that consultation? Particularly if normally your communication would be done via work email addresses. If you've specifically said to staff not to check their work email at, at all whilst they're on furlough, um, there's obviously an issue there then about you know how you issue those communications and, and how you contact the individual to, to commence that consultation process. So that's something to, to give some thought to. Um, but generally, yes, our view is you can carry out the consultation. I know that some unions are kind of taking the view that um, the question's been asked, well, what if, what if you're unionised and your trade union representative has been placed on furlough? Um, can they continue to provide representation and consultation meetings? And helpfully, uh, most of the unions, I think, have taken the view that, yes, they can. They don't view that as work. They, they view that as them providing a service to their members um, and so that they will partake in the, the redundancy consultation process. Um, there's somebody who asked a question about, can you reduce the amount that you pay over a period of furlough? And I think that's a really good question, because, again, it is something that we've seen come up um, where employers have said, well, some employers have said initially we'll pay 100% of salary and we'll obviously just recover the 90%. Um, but over time, it may be that we have to gradually reduce that. And there's also some commentary as well about, well, if the government carry the scheme on beyond the end of June, will they look to adjust the scheme so that they reduce the, um, the amount that they cover from 80% to a lower amount? And it may be that that is what happens as um, businesses gradually reopen we might find the government kind of gradually reduces the assistance that's available through the scheme. So in answer to the question, yes, if you've started off on saying to your employees that you'll pay 100% and place them on furlough, um, strictly speaking, you would then need their consent to reduce the contribution that you're going to pay because 
it's a change, as we've said before, it's a change to their contract of employment. Um, all you'll have changed if you've said 100% and on furlough is the fact that they're on furlough and not coming to work. If you're looking to then reduce that to 90% and you had previously made a commitment to be 100%, then you'll need to get the employee's consent to that. Um, obviously, again, we've spoken before about a number of employers have taken the view where they've not got explicit consent to placing employees on furlough and reducing their salary. You might take the view that you just write out to them to say, um, you know, you continue on furlough, we're now going to reduce your pay to 90%, 80%, um, uh, and we'll assume your consent to that unless we hear otherwise. Your risk is your unlawful deduction of wages claim, um, but you, you know, you, you need to take a view on, on how you handle that. The second part to that question about would this cause discrimination issues is those who are still working are being paid in full. Um, I, I, I don't think it would cause discrimination issues because I think you can show that you've got a reason why those individuals that are on furlough are being paid less than those individuals who are still at work, and it's not because of any of the protected characteristics. It's simply that you, as a business, can't afford to pay people that are on furlough the hundred percent, um, and you've taken the view to make a difference between those that are on furlough and those that are, are at work and are continuing to, to carry out their their role. Um, Jane, is there any others that you can pick up there? Um, yeah, there's just one still. Uh, Touching on this question of, um, you know, if people's jobs are at risk for non-COVID-related reasons, um, can can you use the scheme? I think you need to be really careful about that, to be honest, because you have to make a declaration when you submit your claim online that effectively your claim is relating to circumstances that are arising. Um, as, as I say, from the kind of economic, social, or health implications of of COVID. Um, so, I mean, it's not to say that you couldn't possibly look at justifying it if there's an indirect link. Um, but I I would be very careful about that. I have to say, and I think it's one where you're probably best to take some advice on your particular circumstances to see whether or not um, there there's enough of a, a link there. Um, as we've said before, I think HMRC will be pr processing the payments really quickly just now and very unlikely to get into the granular detail, but I imagine they will be taking quite a um, forensic approach in, in their auditing. So it, it's a case of people actually feeling really confident and comfortable to the extent that they can when they make the claim that they're, um, they're done in accordance with the scheme. Um, I was going to say, I've got one question here, but we have a new starter who started on the 9th of March and was only on the RTI after the 26th of March. Can we put him on furlough from April? Unfortunately, no. The qualification is that you have to have started before the 19th of March and been on an RTI before the 19th of March. So there are a small group of employees who are going to be caught because of the payroll process um, and the fact that although they may have started before the 19th of March, they've not actually appeared on an RTI before that date. Um, so unfortunately, an individual in that category wouldn't be caught. Sorry, Jane, I interrupted you there. No, not at all. Um, I was actually just looking for that for that question to make sure we caught it. Um, and I think there's quite a few questions just about timing of your submissions and yeah. how it links in with your pay periods. Um, I, I, my general sense is don't get too caught up with the three week um, minimum. Right, that is in relation to have they been on furlough for a minimum period of three weeks. It might be that just the way that you pay people or submit your claim that you're you're putting in a claim that's for a portion of the furlough period. And I think that's absolutely fine. Um, the I don't know exactly the, the maximum number of claims put in per month to the portal. I think if it's I think if you're monthly if you've got a monthly payroll, then you just do one per month. I think if you've got weekly payrolls, potentially you might be able to do more than one, but I, I'm not sure. Um, so that would be something that you would need to check, I think. Um, I'm just going to pick up this question about if an employee doesn't want to come back to work because their family has underlying health issues and they don't want to put them at risk, can we furlough the, the employee on that basis? Um, what the guidance says is if you've got an employee who is shielding or someone who is unable to um or sorry, someone who needs to stay at home 
with someone that's shielding, then they can be furloughed. We've talked about this a few times in the team about what's actually meant by someone who needs to stay at home. Does that mean they need to stay at home to care for the individual who's shielding? Or does it just mean that they feel that they need to stay at home because they're with someone who's shielding and if they obviously go out, um, they increase the risk to the individual when they come back? Um, I'm perhaps being optimistic, but my view is the latter of the two. Um, if someone feels that they need to stay at home because they're living with someone that's shielding, I think you can furlough them in answer to your, your question. Um, I, I suppose one of the other views was if you can't, I think you can, but if you can't, the other option is does that individual end up going off sick because they feel that they are undergoing stress, anxiety, etc., because of their situation at home? But um, and my view is, I think you could furlough someone in that scenario. Would you agree, Jane? Yeah. <laughs> You're putting you on the spot. I know we've discussed that a few times. Yeah. We agree with each other, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think that's right. Um, and listen, we're all. Uh, Line is we're all trying to do our best, aren't we, um, interpreting what the guidance says. But for me, uh, we all usually prefer to have a hundred percent guarantee and a, you know, a Supreme Court decision to back up <laughs> what we're what we're telling either our clients or what you guys are um, telling your colleagues within the business. We can only work with the terminology in, in the guidance, and um, you know. If you feel that you've got somebody who is demonstrating that they need to stay at home with someone that's shielding, um, then I think that surely must satisfy it. I think there's a secondary question of um, do you have an obligation to furlough in those circumstances? And we've spoken about about that before. Um, and it may be that you you don't choose to furlough those individuals. Um, you may run risks there in terms of trust and confidence and someone just feeling um, unhappy about the fact that you're not doing something that they think you can do under the scheme, um, but you don't, um, you know, all of these eligibility statements in the guidance are just that. It's that those people are eligible to be furloughed. It's then a decision for the employer to make whether they actually go down that route. There's a question here as well about consultation on other matters or non-furlough related matters, such as workforce related changes. Um, I think you do have to be careful. I think the, the way I kind of expressed it when we were talking about this last week is there's kind of things at one end of the scale that I think you can consult on whilst individuals are on furlough, for example, consultation on redundancy. There's things at the other end of the scale which I think you just can't contact and employees about whilst they're on furlough, you know, asking them to undertake work, etc. And then there's things that probably fall in this kind of grey bit in the middle. Um, if they're workforce related changes that the employee doesn't really need to know about until they come back from furlough, I wouldn't be inclined to, to contact them and discuss them. Um, if there are things that you feel you really should be speaking to them about whilst they're on furlough, um, okay, but I think you would have to be able to demonstrate why you felt you had to do that. The thing to be aware of is the, and actually when you look at the employee guidance, the updated employee guidance, um, it, it's been changed quite heavily to talk about the fact that employees, if any employees feel that their employer is misusing the furlough system, then there's a helpline or a contact line where they can phone and report that misuse. So you just need to be careful how far you go in terms of contact whilst an employee is on furlough. Um, I also noticed in the updated employer guidance, the, the wording has changed there quite a bit to talk about um, you know, any misuse of the scheme and the fact that it's public funds that could otherwise be diverted towards life-saving activities, etc. So um, there's obviously a kind of real push there on making sure that the scheme is used um, appropriately. Uh, yeah, and someone has actually asked, um, and I feel like they must be the same sort of person as me because their question is, what if you make a mistake? Yeah. What if you make yeah. a mistake and you claim, what do you do? And I always uh, like to think what my um, correction strategy is going to be. And listen, people will be making mistakes um, because of the urgency and because you're dealing with loads of figures. And again, if you're not um, used to doing that, that's not straightforward. Um, HMRC have said that if if you get information, i.e. I got it wrong, is the information I got the next day, um, then you just need to let them know and, if appropriate, return the portion of the funds that um, if there's been an overpayment. So 
um, I think hold your hands up as swiftly as you can if you think you've made a mistake um, is, is definitely the way to go on that front. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm kind of conscious of, of time. Um, I'll probably bring it to a close there. Jen, I don't know, do you want to just conclude anything in particular you want to cover before we finish up? Or No, um, I mean, <laughs> I feel like a bit of a fraud because uh, I just had a big fond farewell to you all uh, this time last <laughs> and here we are again. Um, but I guess it's more just to um, emphasise that if we feel um, there's either, I guess, the, um, the sense from you as our network that there's a need for another webinar or, and I'm really hoping it's not the case, or there's a significant shift again, um, then we will we will set up another one. But um, by all means, I mean, I think we've been really encouraged that there's just been such a brilliant demonstration here of how our wider network can work together, share information, help each other out. Um, as, as I've said all along, I think everyone's trying to do their best. So please do continue to share your insights. I'd actually be really interested to hear from people who have made claims, um, if they've got any kind of learnings from that, anything that yeah. suits them, um, that they'd be prepared to share with us. That would that would be really useful intel. Um, so yeah, just a, a thank you from us and we'll we'll keep you updated. And just to say as well, for those of you that are not on our database, if you want access to any of the updates, the best thing to do is just to subscribe to the database. So if you go into the Burnus Paul website under the contact section, um, there's a header there that talks about subscribe um, and you can go in and, and get access to the database there. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, no doubt we'll be setting something up again at some point, but hopefully, as Jen says, we're kind of at a landing place in terms of the guidance that we've got and there shouldn't be too many more changes. But we will look at doing sessions on other topics as things develop. So um, thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye now. Bye.